Will you stand as you're able for this morning's scripture lesson? From both letters to Timothy, the first and second letter to Timothy, hear these words. I am grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me, because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason I received mercy, so that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience, making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the King of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. For this reason, I remind you to rekindle the gift of God that is within you for the laying on of my hands. For God did not give us a spirit of cowardice, but rather a spirit of power and of love and of self-discipline. Do not be ashamed then of the testimony about our Lord or of me, his prisoner, but join with me in suffering for the gospel, relying on the power of God, who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Christ Jesus before the ages began, but it has now been revealed through the appearing of our Savior Christ Jesus, who abolished death and brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Thank you. you may be seated. So we're continuing our series, The Top Ten Letters of Paul. Today we're going to cover both First and Second Timothy. There's probably no question that Paul was not an athlete. However, he did use many athletic images throughout his letters. But one thing's for sure when you read the letters to Timothy, he is one who knew how to pass the ball. He knew how to pass the ball. You say, why do you say that? Well, by the time he wrote the letters to Timothy, Paul is a much older man. He knows that his ministry is very near the end. And so what does he do? He writes to a much younger Timothy, and he passes the ball to him. Now it's up to you, Timothy. Pass the ball. Pass the baton. I now am laying the mantle upon you. You need to now go forth and carry on the message and power and truth of the gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul knew how to pass the ball. And you know, friends, it is a a supreme act of love and concern, to want to pass along to someone else the truth of the message of Jesus Christ, to hand that off to others so that that message might continue forward in the ages to come is truly a supreme act of love and devotion. The Apostle Paul exhibits that here in the letters to Timothy. He calls upon us as believers in Jesus Christ to be those who would pass it along to others as well. So what does the Apostle Paul share with Timothy? What is going to be necessary as he seeks to be faithful to the message of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ? Well, first of all, there's an outline there in your bulletin. If you want to follow along, it will also appear on your screen. The Apostle Paul tells Timothy, stoke the fire. Stoke the fire. Did you see that in the scripture passage? I remind you to rekindle the gift of God which is within you. Throughout the circumstances or situations of our life, sometimes the fire of faith that burns within us, sometimes it can become nothing more than an ember. But the Apostle Paul says, rekindle that ember. Allow the wind of God's Spirit to breathe upon your life again so that that fire of faith might be strong within your heart. Timothy, it's going to be so important that you stoke that fire so that all of the things in life that seek to smother it out are not able to do it. And friends, that's a good reminder to us, but it's also something we need to pass along to those who are coming after us. Keep the fire alive. Stoke that fire. I remember one of the first churches I served was called Waterloo United Methodist Church. It's a very small Methodist church in southern Upshur County. It's still there, in fact. Waterloo United Methodist Church is heated with two potbelly stoves. 
two pot belly stoves. And for the younger generation, you just kind of have to, that's exactly what they looked like. Round cast iron stoves. They heated it with lump coal. They would put lumps of coal in it and heat up the sanctuary. I remember the first winter I was there because right in the middle of one of my sermons, an old fella, just out of habit, I'm sure, walks over to the stove and clanging the door, he opens the door to the pot belly, clang, clang, and then you see him take the poker, and he stokes up the fire. So here I am preaching along in here, clang, clang, and he realizes the timing of it just at that moment, and he kind of looks up at me, and he says to me, preacher, I'm just trying to keep the fire going. Well, I couldn't help it. You know what I'm going to say. You know, brother, I'm trying to do the same. I'm trying to do the same this morning. We're both on the same page. Friends, that's what Paul tells Timothy. That's the image that we need to have in our life. That if the message of the Lord is to go forth not only now but into the future, we not only need to stoke the fire again, rekindle the flame of faith within our hearts, but pass that gift of faith along to someone else. Stoke the fire. Secondly, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, steady your heart. Steady your heart. The Lord has not given us a spirit of cowardice, but a spirit of power and love and self-discipline. Other translations say a sound mind or a focused heart. If we are to be faithful today and if we are to encourage those who come after us to be faithful, they have to have a focused, steady heart. Never forgetting who we are called to be. Never taking our eyes off of what we are called to do. To have that steady, focused heart. So important, not only in experiencing the good news, but in passing the good news along to someone else. Eric Fellman tells the story of going to visit his son Jason. Jason was a lifeguard for the summer at a large lake resort. He said he and his wife went to visit him during the summer, and he wanted to go down to the lakeside. Jason was on duty as a lifeguard and tell him that we had arrived and that after his shift we'd meet him for dinner. He said we went down to kind of the beachy area along the lake and there was a concert going on. So there was a lot of people over here dancing and waving and going with the music. And he said there were still several children swimming there in the lake on the beach and so forth and so on. And Eric Feldman said I was never more proud of my son. He said because as I went down there and I found him and I started to talk to him. So here's the music and the craziness and the carrying on over here. Here I am trying to tell him where we would meet. But he said, my son never took his eyes off the lake shore. The whole time I was talking to him, his eyes were still scanning the beach, watching the children, doing what he was supposed to do, focused on his job, in spite of everything that was going around him. He said, there he was, focused on why he was there. I love that story, friends, because it really is a reminder to us that's what it means to have a steady heart. Amidst all of the distractions that life will throw at us, and they are many, we know, amidst all of the chaos, to keep our eyes, to keep our eyes steady and focused upon Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith, to constantly be focused on who we are called to be and what we are called to do, as followers of Jesus Christ. Friends, it's a great reminder to us, have a steady heart. But it's part that we need to pass along to others as well. Amidst the distractions of the world, we need to be telling our family and friends and others, steady your heart. That focus will see you through. Third, the Apostle Paul says to Timothy, stand in grace. Now remember I said that the Apostle Paul has been in ministry a number of years now. He's preached about the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ all of these years. He's ready to pass it off to Timothy for him to move on with it. But notice what he says even after all of this time of following Jesus. There in the first letter, the saying is sure and, and worthy of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. So the Apostle Paul, this missionary preacher, says when it comes to sin... I'm number one. But, he says, the grace of God has overflowed. Relying on the power of God, notice in the second, in the second letter, 
who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace. This grace was given to us in Jesus Christ. Friends, if we are to be who God has called us to be, we need to stand in that grace every day. And if there's one thing we should be passing along to those that we care about, it is the grace of God will be sufficient for your every need. Stand in that grace. Grace means the unmerited, undeserved love and favor of God. Friends, I can't tell you how important this is today. Hear me for one moment. Because so many times we teach our young people, and sometimes we ourselves have bought into it, that self-value, that our worth is tied to our achievements. So if I tie my worth to what I've achieved, what happens when I fail? which we will, then it is a crushing blow. But if we say to one another, base your worth upon the grace of God, your intrinsic value is based upon the fact that God gave his only son for you. You didn't deserve it. You didn't work for it. You didn't merit it. It's offered as a gift. Bask in that gift. Then it will set you free to live as you will. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm for people achieving and so forth. But if you base your value there, your self-worth, eventually your spirit will be crushed. But the grace of God? Nah. The grace of God comes through every single time. And sometimes it's hard to believe that. I realize when we realize that we failed or we've fallen or circumstances of life, it's, it's hard to reach out and, and accept that hand of God's grace. It, it reminds me of, of little kids through the years who've come out and greeted me after church to shake the preacher's hand. You know, the, the, the very little ones, I'll stick out my hand and they're hide behind their parents and they're walk on by. Who's this guy and what's he want? You know, and then they get a little bit older and, 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 and you try to greet them and maybe they'll stick out a hand around their parents, you know, and just take a real, a real timid handshake. But then finally I watch them grow and, and mature and they get older and the first thing you know, they come out and they're shaking your hand and they're moving on. That's, that's, I feel like that child sometimes, knowing that I have missed the mark, like the Apostle Paul, knowing that I have sinned in my life. You know, do I, God's extending his hand of grace, but... I don't know, Lord, I'm not sure. But then the more we walk toward that grace, the more we receive that hand of grace that God is offering to us, and we grow in it every day. We realize how precious and amazing and awesome that unmerited love of God is. And we can stand in that grace. The other thing that it does is it not only helps us to see ourselves worthy, why? Because God has forgiven us in Jesus Christ. So I, I view myself differently. I'm able to see myself as a forgiven person. But I, it also helps me view others. Because you see, with grace, I can no longer, any time, consider that I'm better than someone else. Grace doesn't allow that. Because we're all, we're all undeserved. We've all received what we don't deserve. Therefore, I can see all of humanity the same. And what a free and whole way to live. Good reminder for us. Wonderful news to pass along. Stand in grace. Finally, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, Timothy, as you carry the ball forward and carry the baton forward, stay thankful. Stay thankful. Have that deep-seated sense of gratitude deep within your soul. Very first sentence that we read. Ben read it, I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord. Right there, right at the beginning. I'm grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe that'd be the thing to do. When we wake up every morning and we take that first breath, I am grateful to Christ Jesus our Lord. Help to create that deep-seated sense of thankfulness within our hearts and within the core of who we are. We know the difference. You've met people along your journey who, are, who just must be ungrateful because there's always a chip on their shoulder, they're sort of hateful, cold. But then you meet some other people along the way that are, they're, they're so appreciative, they're so grateful, and there's a lightness to their spirit. They're kind, they're compassionate, we know the difference. 
between gratefulness and non-gratefulness and the difference that it can make deep within our hearts. And the Apostle Paul is saying to Timothy, Timothy, there's going to be a lot of circumstances that are going to be very difficult for you ahead. And we know from the tradition that Timothy's journey was indeed a very difficult one. But stay thankful. Be grateful. You know, in this my fourth decade of ministry, I've met a lot of people through the years that had that sense of gratitude deep within their heart. And I think of one elderly gentleman in one of my churches he was, it was a small church. He was one of these guys that, that sort of cheered the service along and cheered the, the preaching along. You know, maybe you've heard of that or come from that tradition. But, you know, you hear me say sometimes, we'll, we'll sometimes after a song say amen. Some of you sometimes say amen. Well, his word was glory. So after the opening hymn, you'd hear glory. Well, you may not realize this. I'm sure he didn't necessarily know this. But the word for glory and praise in the New Testament Greek is doxa. Same word, praise and glory. We get our word doxology from that, an act of praise, an act of glory to God. But that was his word, glory. I'd be preaching along, and you know, sometimes I get a little intense, a little animated. He would say, glory. And that was it. No big show. Just every now and then, glory. This elderly gentleman, his great-grandson, was born prematurely and did not make it. I remember the very first Sunday after that. He was in church, no doubt heartbroken, grieving just like the rest of his family. We sang our opening hymn. And what did I hear at the end of that opening hymn when we finished? Yep, you heard it. Glory. There he said it. Glory. Glory right into the face of heartache and agony beyond belief. Glory. Now, where does that come from? Where does that come from? A deep-seated sense of thankfulness for all that God has done in Jesus Christ, no doubt strengthened through His years of faithfulness. Friends, it's a reminder to us to stay thankful, but if we want to fruitfully and effectively pass it along to someone else, we remind them as well of the importance of that thankfulness being deep within the core of who we are. The Apostle Paul passed the ball along to Timothy. I pray that we receive that good news, but we also pass it along as well. Stoke the fire, steady your heart, stand in grace, stay thankful. Let us pray. Oh God, every day you lavish us with your grace and mercy. You surround us with your awesome love. Every day we are recipients of who you are. We pray that not only would you strengthen our hearts with your grace, with a true sense of thankfulness, but that you would empower us to pass the message along to others, that the name of Christ might be glorified, glorified throughout the ages. In his name we pray. Amen.